I am James Swanick, and today on the show, we've got Wade Lightheart, who is the co-founder and president at BioOptimizers, a digestive and health optimization company. He's a three-time Canadian national all-natural bodybuilding champion who competed as a vegetarian, a former Mr. Universe competitor. He's the host of the Awesome Health podcast. And he's one of the world's premier authorities on natural nutrition and training methods. Wade has been in the health industry for over 25 years. He's coached thousands of clients and he's sought out by athletes and high performance oriented individuals worldwide for his advice on how to optimize their health and fitness levels. And uh, he and I have worked out next to each other a couple of times at Gold's Gym in Venice Beach. And we've bumped into one another at the Air One supermarket at uh, Venice Beach. And I recall being in, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, or Scottsdale, Arizona with him actually at a business yeah. mastermind as well where we got to socialize a little bit and hang out and have some fun. Wade, how are you, mate? Great to have you here. Dude, always a pleasure when we get to connect, so uh, it's great to be on the show. Thank you for having me. Um, just before we started recording here, you were telling me about your cool little home or pad in Venice Beach, California. Just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so... Um... You know, there's a, you know, this is a good point to bring up for people because with this COVID craziness, there's a lot of people focused on the negativity and and I can believe that when it all happened, I had moved down to Venice. I was excited to train at Gold's Gym and I got this place close to the beach. COVID broke out. We didn't know what was going on. I went to Sedona for three months so everything kind of settled. The gym was closed. They opened Gold's back. I said, yay, my dream is going to come true. I came back. And I found myself living in the most expensive ghetto in America, trash all over the streets. I was breaking up fights between domestic disputes between people who were, you know, on drugs or mentally ill or something like that, homeless, all that sort of stuff. And not, it was, it was not a good place to be, especially the price I was paying. So long story short, we went wandering through a little ways away here and we found this brand new building that had never been used. And because the rates were depressed because of the market challenges that are happening because of it, I was able to negotiate a great deal. And so now I have right here, we're in my office, which is on the bottom floor. And then we got two floors of living space uh, on the second and third floor with biohacking rooms that we're filling up with all kinds of gear. And then I've got my own gym, which I've moved from Gold's to God's gym as I'm under the great blue dome with sunshine and palm trees and and a power rack and an assortment of uh, gizmos that allows me to continue on with my training career. And the ironic thing is, I was up there about a month into this training, and you know, I mean, it doesn't have all the equipment that you'd have at a Gold's gym, but I went, you know, I don't really care if the gym opens up again. I'm having so much fun training outdoors here in the sunshine and the other stuff. Yeah, I don't have all the other things, but if Gold's doesn't open up, doesn't matter. I'm happy as a clam. Anyways, I'm not going to let external circumstances ruin my life. Yeah, that's a great attitude. And just for context, if someone's listening and they're not familiar with Gold's Gym, Gold's Gym is kind of like the mecca of bodybuilding, isn't it? It's it's right there in Venice Beach, California. It's where Arnold Schwarzenegger and all of the original OGs of the Mr. Olympia um, championships used to train. Um, when I lived in Venice Beach, I, I would often see Schwarzenegger um, training. In fact, I got to do um, two sets of uh, lat pull downs with him one time, which was which was a great thrill for me. Um, yep. He didn't really say much, but just doing it with him and like you know waiting for him to finish and then you know exercising with him for those two rounds, it was like it was a great thrill. Um, and I, as I understand it, Gold's just shut down completely when COVID hit. Is is that right, Wade? Yeah, they did, and they had a brief opening for ten days, and uh, then they closed back down again and. It's been that way ever since, and and it's sad. And rather than get depressed about the whole thing, I started to find ways around it. And turned out, I found the bio home, and now I have my the best biohacking center. And it's only going to get better from here on out. And so, you know, you got to when you life gives you lemons, you, you you can either just you know sit there with with a sour taste in your mouth, or you can get to work and turn it into lemonade. And I really believe in that philosophy. And so, um, it's been it's you know despite all the mitigations and and my personal opinion about the whole thing, which is another story. Uh, we're moving forward regardless of what you know 
fat people in suits who have power as their interest as opposed to my health and well-being and interest whatever they're doing it's irrelevant to what i'm going to be able to do with what i can do in my life and i encourage everyone to think the same way and and then today i got my new set of swanee swannies which are pretty style and i gotta say I'm, I'm, i almost look intelligent with these things so <laughs> i'm feeling very strong and powerful with this so so, so if you're listening and you're not quite sure what's going on, Wade is wearing a pair of uh, the Swannies blue light blocking glasses, the nighttime ones with the orange lens. I'm wearing a pair of the daytime ones with the clearer lens with the aviators. Um, just, on, just on that, have you seen um, both sides of the coin where you've seen people who, when COVID hit, they responded sim in a similar fashion to the way you did, which is, okay, I've got lemons, I'm going to make lemonade, and they've shifted and now they feel that their situation is now better. Likewise, have you had friends in your community uh, who have gone the other way where COVID hit and, you know, life has given them lemons, but they're still going, wow, life has, has given me lemons. Have you seen both of those sides? And, and I have. And what are your thoughts on that? I have. And keep in mind, to, you know, to be clear, when this first hit, we didn't know anything I exited out of the big city because I recognized immediately that the consequences of whatever this thing was could be definitely severe and significant. Um, and I said I needed to gather information and data to kind of make a choice. And there was it was, you know, it was all over the place and still is today, still is today. And um when I came back, I wasn't sure if I was going to continue to live in the city. I had a lot of my friends move out. I've seen a lot of businesses close down, uh, especially the brick and mortars. And I really think it's unfair. And it doesn't make much sense to me how the mitigations are different in every state and sometimes even in cities, how somehow COVID can be blocked by a plexiglass glass, or I can wear a mask standing up. I don't know at the lineup to the restaurant, but I can sit outside literally a foot away from that. And now I don't have to wear a mask. So I do believe that there is much more at foot here. And I think that people have got to recognize that even though the data has actually shifted, uh, like this, the, the CDD, CDC has changed its, you know, and we talk about comorbidities and we talk about all this sort of stuff. The fact that we're still in a lockdown, the fact that we have agents that are using this as for political gain uh, one way or the other, I think is despicable. It's horrific. And we have yet to see the real consequences and the economic consequences. We have no one's talking about the millions of people who have died worldwide because of the financial consequences that trickle down into developing countries and things like that. And so I think what we have is a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety. And when you're faced with stress, see, stress is a normal part of living. And this is a, an incredible amount of stress and there's a, a, an incredible array of co conflictive information. And then whatever camp you start to lean to, the algorithms keep rewarding that until you end up in some sort of tribalism, which now has a political overtone outside of the medical side of it. And people are have lost mistrust with each other. They're going crazy on all this sort of stuff. And and but the, the economic damage is real and, and it's going to continue because all these stimulus bills, we're all paying for it. And that's going to be a consequence. Now, in the meantime, during this time, a lot of people have been focused on who's right, who's wrong. So a lot of people have been focused on um, what you're going to do. Now, I've had friends that had their brick and mortar businesses completely shut down and wiped out, destroyed. And they're doing extraordinary. They've never been, in fact, I was talking to a good friend of mine last night. His business was absolutely decimated, family business, been around for 35 years. And he has redeveloped a new relationship with his kids. He's taken his health to the next level. He got to take care of some things that were on the line, on the thing. And I was talking to him last night. He said, this has been the best thing that's ever happened to him. He's taken his kids to school. He's got a relationship with his kids. He's, he's upgraded his gym. The kids are training, the family's training, they're biking together. He says, I'm having a whole experience of life that I've never had in his entire history. It's awesome. No, he says, I'm not winning financially, but I'm winning in other areas. Uh, I've got people like our company. We've exploded with growth. We've, you know, our, our company has caught in 
more attention and more interest because of many of the immune system supporting products that we have, the people taking their health, the fact that we're a digital based company and aren't relying on brick and mortar, the fact that we can all live isolated in our, in our places around the world and work and, and do our work and all those things. So we were a company that did well. And then there's other people that got destroyed and other people that are, you know, wasting all their time on things that they can't control. And they're getting stressed out and they're getting anxious. And, and I think that is very real. You know, if you look at suicide, you look at a pharmaceutical abuse and use and alcohol and uh, violence and crime and all these things that have gone up in a lot of different areas with which people who have made maybe made poor choices in their response to this situation. The evidence would certainly indicate that being able to handle stress and having a healthy body and a healthy mind and the ability to step back and analyze information and go, hmm, is the narrative I'm listening to true? But what does the real facts, what does critical thinking say? And uh, I'm just grateful to be in, the, in, in the, the positive side of that camp. Could have been terrible, but it worked out all right for me. So there's part luck and part action. So the part action, the, the thing, the mindset that drives your action, where did you and how did you develop that? As I said, when I was introducing you, you're a three-time Canadian national or natural bodybuilding champion. You competed as a vegetarian. You've been a former Mr. Universe competitor. Um, you know, how, just tell us a little bit about your story about how you developed this mindset of turning lemons into lemonade and how you, how you view all of your actions in the world. Well, there's, there's two major influences that I would have to say in my early formative years that made that impact. And the first one was my father. And we were living in a very rural environment. We didn't have a lot of money. So if something broke on the car or something broke on the house or we had to build something or, or, or fix something, my dad went out there and figured it out, oftentimes with poor tools, poor equipment, lack of resources, and just ingenuity, creativity, and 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 I worked with him for a number of years. And keep in mind, it was it was five miles to my nearest neighbor in the, on a dirt road in the middle of the woods. And so, what do you do when the power goes out and you don't get the roads plowed for three days? You better be prepared. You better have firewood ready. You better have generators ready. Um, what do you do? If, you know, if you can't have access to food for extended periods of time, sometimes you couldn't get to the grocery store for maybe a week. You had to be prepared for all these things. There was no internet back then. There was no GPS back then. Um, you needed to know how to, to, to fix the snowblower when it wasn't working right. You needed to know how to do these things. And so my dad taught me a self-reliance of how to deal with extreme levels of adversity where there was no one to turn to. There was no Google. There was no Amazon. There was no any of these things. And so my dad instilled that into me. And I think those little wins, whether it was figuring out how to fix the carriage on the lawnmower, whether it was, uh, you know, learning how to jerry rig something so it would hold together so I could get home. These little things, I think, built a little bit of confidence of what to do when something happened. And also the importance of preparation for when bad things happen, because sooner or later, bad things are going to happen in everybody's life. And it's how you're going to handle it, how you're going to manage it. So that was that thing. But that was more of a management of crisis. It wasn't really moving to a position of excellence. And funny, you should bring up Arnold Schwarzenegger because when I was 15 years old, um, as many people know my backstory, uh, we moved to this rural place. I had, I had, it was a 15 minute ride to get, uh, sometimes on a snowmobile to get to the bus, an hour bus ride to school, an hour bus ride home, 15 minutes back up the hill, taken away from all my friends, all that stuff. It sucked. I hated it. My sister was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, a form of cancer. My parents were completely, uh, you know, integrated in trying to get her care. She died after four years of, of watching just the most horrific transformation of a world-class athlete going to death. Uh, that was a very stressful time and you had to learn to manage that. But she gave me a bodybuilding magazine, had Troy Zaclato on the cover, Mr. California, two pretty girls on it. And he had all these muscles and they were pretty and I was going out of my mind with testosterone. 
And I was like, I got into working out. And, and at that time, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the number one television uh, star in the world. He was a former Mr. Universe, Mr. Uh, Olympia. He was married to the Kennedys. He was living in California. He had everything that I want in his book, education. I picked up his book, Education of a Bodybuilder. And inside that book, he said, you can achieve anything you want in life with three basic things, a positive attitude, self-discipline, and hard work. Now, I had heard the hard work story. Everybody I knew around me worked really, really hard and had nothing to show for it but aching joints, broken bones, uh, arthritis, and dysfunction. But a positive attitude and self-discipline wasn't something I heard about. And I became the, the disciple, if you will, of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I just preached whatever Arnold said. I got his encyclopedia of bodybuilding. I read his books. I watched his movies. I watched Conan the Barbarian once a week because it was the story of this guy that was in this terrible life and he was a slave and he was thrown into cage fighting and he just kept overcoming challenges until eventually he became the victor and king by his own hand. And, I, and that was a story that I was like, that's me. And I took on that that super person, that, that, that person that stopped at nothing, that could, you know, this Terminator mentality, that every obstacle is something that you gives you an opportunity to rise beyond. And, and that's what I've implemented into my life ever since. And, it, and it's worked out. Yeah. Um, so the, you had the hard work down packed. How did you cultivate the positive attitude? Like, how did you? That was the day? toughest part. Yeah. Because I was in an environment of negative Nellies. And, and my natural nature is extremely negative by nature. I'm one of those people because of the training that my father put inside me. You're always looking for the flaw in things. Is the tires down? Is the brakes not working? Is the oil not checked? Is the roof shingle going? So I, I just notice these things. And there's a negative association in how you identify that because in rural environments, when you're running a woodcutter, you're running a bulldozer, you're running a, 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 a tractor or something like that, people scream at you in a very, I would say, politically incorrect tone with uh, damaging language to get your attention. And the reason is because if you make a mistake, somebody loses an arm, somebody's house gets knocked down or somebody dies. And so this gets burnt into your nervous system very early, and it's very hard to overcome this. In fact, my statement at my university graduation in my yearbook was, life is not fair, so neither am I. That was, that was where I was at 18 years old. Now, I was reading the books, and I was doing this stuff, and I was really identified, I think, with the, the, the victim of the slave that was working away, and I was angry and frustrated and didn't know how to go, but I just wanted out, and I was going to do whatever it took. But over time through training, through Tony Robbins, through Arnold Schwarzenegger, through a, a spiritual uh, endeavor, uh, uh, everything that you could possibly, every tool, chemical, herb, uh, experience, teacher that I could find. And I started to notice patterns. And the most successful people that I met developed extremely positive attitudes for extended period of times, even under trying conditions. And over time, slowly but slow, surely, it seemed to warp into uh, become an, ex a, a, an extreme optimist. I'm actually the opposite now. Um, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, and when things are bad, I'm like, hey, it's really sucky and bad. Isn't that great? Because it's going to make a great story when we win. Yeah, I like that. It's like a, I call that the flipper Rooney, where yeah. I, remember being in, I remember being in San Francisco 2013 with a friend of mine, Manish Saiti, and we were, we were staying in the mission for about 30 days. We've got an Airbnb place there, and we were working on a little business idea. And um, it, it, if anyone's been to San Francisco in July, you would, you would think that it would be super hot because like, that's a U.S. summer, right? But it's actually dark and gray and quite cold because of the way that the the the, the wind or the temperature the comes or the air comes off the is it the San Francisco Bay? I got to make yeah, sure. Yeah, it's it. terrible. It's cold yeah. and just eerie it's, and foggy and nasty. Oh, shocking in the middle of July. Anyway, we uh, I started complaining about this a few days in a row. I was like, oh god, it's so I can't believe it's July and it's cold. I got to wear a jumper to go to the gym. And and Manish and I realized that we were complaining like a lot after a few days. And we, we agreed that we were going to come up with this system that at any time we caught ourselves complaining, we would then have to finish the sentence with a positive. So the first time we started this, it was like, oh man, it's so overcast again today. And then we both look at each other and go, 
which is awesome because I it's different and it's moody and it kind of is like uh, didn't uh, that famous author say describe San Francisco? Um, I think it was Oscar Wilde or someone described San Francisco as being gloomy in the summer in in the summer in San Francisco. Isn't it cool that we get to live into that very famous story? You know, like we just even if it didn't make any sense, the the the, the sense that the fact that we were attempting to complete the sentence with a positive did two things. One, it rewired our brain into looking at every obstacle as a potential opportunity to turn it around. And two, it actually just reduced the number of times that we complained. Exactly. And you do have to make these little tricks, um, whatever it takes, um, in order to repattern thinking. Because most of our thoughts are habitual patterns. They're not actually really legitimate. And many of those have been programmed into us by the people that we hang around or what are our influences. And then that becomes quote unquote, our truth. And what you expose yourself to and what you continually kind of recycle to your brain is can, can lift you to the highest heights and it can take you to the lowest depths and, and being mindful of what comes into your consciousness is perhaps the most important decision that anybody makes in their life and you need to make it every single day. What uh, barriers do you put up to prevent the stuff that you don't want to enter into your conscious or your subconscious? Yeah, great question. So um, first and foremost, I do a little bit of a review every evening. So I start my, I like start my day with an energization and a meditation practice. And I end my day oftentimes with a meditation and energization practice. But even if I don't do the meditation, um, I will review the day in my mind. I'll lie down in bed and I'll be thinking about, all right, what were the interactions of the day? What things did I respond in a good way? And what things did I respond in a poor way? And then I analyze. And if I notice patterns that I'm responding poorly in certain circumstances or around certain people, I, I dive a little deeper into those conversations. And it's, it's kind of easy to spin off into a form of negativity or positivity, just by depending who you're around. The other thing uh, I learned from one of my teachers is how do I feel after I spend time with someone, after I, you hang out with someone for an hour, two hours, whatever, and I walk away, what is, what, what is the overall feeling that I have at that time? Am I upbeat and positive or do I feel drained? And if I feel drained, I, I got to limit my exposure to that person or those ideas. Um, the other thing is, is if, we, if I start catching myself going down a negative track, which I still, like I said, it's easy to do. I try to edit it, and, 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 and I love your word, flipperoonie. I'm going to borrow that one. I, I, you gotta, I, I try and track it in a direction where we go somewhere that's a little bit more positive, a little bit more upbeat, a little bit more productive. Now, that doesn't mean to be Pollyanna, and that doesn't mean that you're not supportive of people who are going through a tough time. I, one of the things that I think almost all of my close friends would tell you is I'm always ready to lend a hand or an ear to my friends who are in having a challenge and it's going to happen to me. It's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to everybody. But if they're in that continual state and there's like a, a recurring pattern, I'll be like, yeah, you know, I, I heard this program before as, as anything changed, you're okay with your decision. But if you're bringing this dump load of, of, of shite into my world, is there something to change? My, my advice or my information or anything I got is not going to change. I'm not saying I'm right, but I've got nothing to offer you on this topic. So can we move on to another topic or shall we just move on? Mm. And uh, I am much more disciplined about that. That was an idea before, but now, you know, being a co-founder of a company and all the, 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 the onslaught of information choices and opinions and peoples and opportunities and and decisions I got to make. I, I only can make so many decisions in my life and I only have so much physical or emotional re rev or capital to, to disperse. And if I'm getting leaks by hanging out with the negative Nellies, I got to cut it. Um, so those are things. The other thing I would say is uh, neurofeedback. I've done a lot of neurofeedback training. I've been to BioCybernaut and 40 Years of Zen. They're extraordinary programs. And those have allowed me to accelerate my meditation practice, my, my awareness practice, 
which helps me identify both my own patterns of behavior that's not where I want it to be, but also to kind of create more optimal thinking and operating or emotional patterns in my, in my, in my being. So it's, it's a continuous upgrade and things come up. I just had one the other day. I was noticing that I had to pick up and I'm like, okay, that, that's something I, I really want to get rid of. So it's, it never ends. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about your company and how that was formed and, you know, what you produce and how does, how does supplements of, you know, fit in with, what you're talking about here, like the mindset and the um, the mind work, I guess you would say, like you discuss things about meditation. Uh, I have a lot of my clients in my quit drinking business do what I refer to as the daily 20, which is twenty writing down 20 things they're grateful for every day to rewire their brain, to activate their reticular activating system so they, they start to see opportunities and see things to be grateful for rather than seeing you know, blocks and, and things to lament all the time. So I'm just curious about your, your, you know, supplements and optimization and um, business. How did that get created and where does that fit in amongst a whole, a whole holistic approach to mental and health well-being? Well, yeah, well, early on in my bodybuilding years uh, from, you know, my teenage years and I was reading magazines and learning about nutrition and supplementation. And I studied exercise physiology and nutrition at the University of New Brunswick. And then I got a sports nutrition degree and I worked at every area of the nutrition industry from working in supplement stores, owning my own supplement stores, being a representative uh, of various brands as an athlete, and then eventually uh, writing books. And uh, in 2004, my business partner, partner Matt Gallant, uh, came to me. He, we were both personal trainers at the time, and he said, uh, "Yeah, let's uh, let's do a bodybuilding book." You just got back from the Mister Universe contest uh, as a vegetarian. That's really uh, no drugs. That's really weird. I think we can sell money on the internet. I thought he was crazy. I said, "What do you mean you're making money on the internet? That doesn't make any sense." Um, and I didn't even own a computer at the time. I had been living in an ashram in India uh, prior after the Mister Universe and. Uh, I was considering being a monk, but the monk said, no, I wasn't going to cut it. So uh, <laughs> I came back and uh, he put this offer to me. And so we started a bodybuilding company and I had gone through a real breakdown of digestive distress after that contest. I, from people who don't know, I gained 42 pounds of fat and water in 11 weeks and I had to rebuild my digestive system under the guidance of a doctor. And he introduced me to high powered uh, nutritional supplements, enzymes, probiotics. We were talking about the microbiome back there, enzyme stuff and minerals. I went on a raw food diet and I, and literally in a, in a few months, I recaptured my health and, and hit a new level of performance and well being. And over the course of four years, kind of optimized that with about 15,000 different athletes around the world that were on boards at the time. And we were sharing information, they were buying our products and we were trying all these experiments clinically. And Matt and I, recognize one of the problems that I had as being a vegetarian is that I couldn't get enough amino acids from the food that I was and the protein I was eating to recover. Uh, you know, at the time I was, I went on a raw food diet. So it, there was really hard. There was no protein powders, nothing in the, the, those days. I and mean, so we started down that route and I did him and I determined that we were going to build some nutritional supplementation that could augment the performance of athletes and people such as myself who had a compromise, essentially I had a compromised digestion and I had a compromised uh, diet. And I said, well, if I can make it work for me, I, we can make it work for anyways. Now keep in mind, Matt's a keto guy. We're polar opposites of the dietary spectrum and we have all sorts of discussions. Um, and we're frankly, we're dietary agnostic. We think that you should choose what's right for you at the time and season of your life, regardless of what that is. Mitigate it's Every diet has an, uh, benefits and liabilities and to assess them equally and mitigate the liabilities and accentuate the benefits and remain flexible enough that you can go to somewhere else. So we started producing supplements and we made a pact with ourselves at that time that we would never put, we would never compromise the mission for margin. We were just going to make products that we wanted and that we liked and that worked for us. And if they worked for us, maybe they would work for other people. Well, that resulted in us paying ourselves in pills for about 10 years. Uh, we, we, the money that we made, we just put it all back into R&D and, and all back into the business and never paid ourselves. We just loved the process of it. And, you know, uh, it was been, it's been great. And then 
about five years ago, we rebranded because we figured over the course of this time, we figured out we had solved most of the digestive problems that people have. And we went out of an athletic model to more of an open to a lot of, you know, expanded our market. We, we weren't really in the bodybuilding world or anything like that. I was, I was just an old geezer and irrelevant to that market. And uh, so we decided we would go on and, and keep going. And that's where we rebranded as Bioptimizers. And really, at that point, that's when things really took off for us. We also were able to contract some world-class doctors and chemists and uh, genetic experts. And we have PhDs in microbiome working for us that test our products. So we, we, we go all in very much like a pharmaceutical company does in order to produce the best products that we can. And we back them up. And uh, we've got kind of like a cult-like following because... There's a lot of people with digestive issues, and then now we're moving into nervous system optimization and, as well as uh, neurological optimization. Uh, just before we continue, um, if you go to bioptimizers.com forward slash Swanick, that'll take you to the Bioptimizers store, and uh, you can actually get 10% off if you use the code Swanick10. So Swanick, S-W-A-N-W-I-C-K 10, we'll get you 10% off there. <clears throat> 10% off there, I'm sorry. Uh, you can go to buyoptimizers.com forward slash Swanick. Um, so what are some of the, you said digestion. Um, I've got two questions here. So you mentioned before vegetarian versus keto. So I'm assuming your business partner, Matt, eats meat and steak and all that kind of stuff. Yep. You don't eat meat currently, is that correct? No, I, I haven't eaten uh, animal flesh since uh, 2001. Got so, it. Yeah, so I guess we're at oh, getting close to 20 years. So getting close to 20 years, you haven't eaten animal flesh. Your business partner, Matt, does eat animal flesh. He's Every keto, day. Which, yeah, every day. It's the opposite. What's he eating? We'd have to ask him, but uh, the thing is, is there's one thing that we do share and that we're always doing experiments on ourselves with various diets. So on any given week, He's Matt's probably running at least a half a dozen experiments on himself and I'm at least running one or two. He's certainly, I think in many ways, more experimental and, uh, on the nutrition side. And I might be more experimental in some other areas of life. Got it. Um, and I, you said a few minutes ago that really you're, you're agnostic, you're diet ag agnostic. So from 20 years of being a vegetarian and not eating meat and from 20 years of knowing Matt and him, him eating animal flesh, um, are, are the reactions to your respective bodies so vastly different that you can definitively say, ah, oh, you know, my way is definitely, you know, if I was going to do a blanket statement for all of society, my way is definitely better. Or, or do you both get similar results in terms of your overall health and outlook, et cetera, that maybe it doesn't, it's, Maybe, you know, the style of, of eating isn't as important as, as we think. This is a deep question, and I'm glad you asked it. In fact, we're working on a book to actually flesh that out because it's very hard to flesh that out in one statement. But I will put it this way. I think, and today we were actually reviewing uh, a hierarchy of choices one needs to make relative to their diet, and it involves everything from your spiritual philosophy, social customs, um, genetics, epigenetics, lifestyle, your goals, um, values, which could be related to whether a person's going to use drugs or not use drugs, uh, whether that's pharmaceutical drugs that are prescribed or non-pharmaceutical options or black markets. That I mean, there's, a, there's just a vast array of decisions that I think to the layman, there's so much information that is not dispensed to the population when people are talking about diet books. They don't talk about many of the factors that may have bigger influences than the diet itself. Also, when you're looking at peer-reviewed studies for all our PhD uh, friends and that stuff, is we very few studies that I'm aware of actually, if you look at it, um, filter out genetic variants and epigenetical variances in that group. And what I would say is that every diet, I've been around long enough that I see these fads come in and come out every few years. And then right now we're, we, we kind of peaked on the keto trend. It's kind of coming down and paleo was a few years ago and 
raw food veganism was a few years now the fasting trend is 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 catching hold and 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 you know pretty soon there'll be people that'll be bashing that and so what happens is one group bashes the old system with the new system and and here's something that's really clear to, of how we look at it if we put you or any group of people on any given diet say we put this group on keto, this group on plant-based diets, this group on paleo diets, this group as carnivore, this group is raw foodist. That group of people, and as the group gets bigger and bigger, you're going to have a distrib distribution on a bell curve of the results and benefits. Some people are going to die on that diet. Some people are going to feel miserable on that diet. Bunch of people are going to feel okay. Some people are going to feel good. Some people are going to feel great. And some people are going to like overcome some debilitating condition that was life-threatening. When you hear the stories and testimonials and stuff of any given diet, guess what you're going to hear? Uh, if on the positive side, you're going to hear people at that top of the bell curve that, that, that changed their life and they were, you know, they became a super genius and more creative and had better sex and, they cured uh, 14 different diseases that were terminal and couldn't fix for over 30 years. And then the bashers are going to be the people that tried that diet. They almost died. They contracted some condition that took them years to get over. And they said they needed to find a better way. And they discovered this new diet and gave it to it. And they did the exact same thing that the people that they bashed did. And that is they selectively picked the best results as to bolster the social credits of why that diet philosophy is better. And so we continue on this cycle. And now with Google algorithms and Facebook algorithms and social media algorithms, what happens is people get into these echo chambers and these feedback loops. And when you're given a plethora of decisions to make and information to make, well, what happens, we take shortcuts in our brain and we default to the tribals, what the tribal rules, values, and, and beliefs. And usually the most outspoken person of that group now becomes the de facto, quote unquote, representative of that group and gets on there and starts going to war with the other tribes who, who are, have a different belief. So we have completely, we, we thought that the internet was going to unify and connect people. The un, unintended consequences of it was, and it did, but we still have this tribalistic brain inside of the human psyche that is now activated as, a, as an emergency threat response system to default to the tribal beliefs so that one can maintain its survival. Because when you have conflicting information, it's a threat to your survival. And so we see this playing out in politics. We play, see it playing out in health. We see it playing out in business. We see it playing out in social groups. And as a society, we've got, we've got to recognize that that's why I say I'm dietary agnostic. And that's kind of not the, maybe the answer you expected. But what I'm here to say is I'm going to suspend any idea of what I think someone should eat. We're going to run them through a barrage of tests. Then we're going to let that person experiment with those tests. And then we're going to continually to evolve and tweak as we go through the different seasons of my life. Because guess what? I'm not as interested of going to the gym, turning up heavy metal to full blast and squatting till I barf uh, in the gym and, and go and not being able to walk for a few years on end in order to get bigger and to grow at this stage of my life. That was really cool when I was 20. I was excited to do that. Right now, I want to go upstairs in my gym. I want to train. I want to stay fit. I want to enjoy the sunshine. I want to cruise on down to Bulletproof after, take a cryo, maybe go for a walk on the beach get back because I'm focusing here on my business life and I'm not as active as I would be. So I'm, you know, I'm 30 years removed and, there, and, and, and my nutritional supplementation should echo that as well as the decisions I make. And in order to do that, I needed an array of, of, of expert opinions that are going to give me feedback. And then I got to experiment with those and weed out what works with what, 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 what doesn't work. And that's, that's, that's the overarching philosophy. It seems like personalized health is really um, a way to describe what you're what you're describing here. I remember someone saying this to me like six, six, seven years ago, said, oh, personalized health is going to be the way of the future. I said, what do you mean by that? And the gentleman um, was telling me, you know, like it's everyone's different. Everyone has a different genetic makeup. Um, 
We see now you can change your, your genetics by the by stimuli. You know whether you were bullied as a kid in the playground, whether your mother loved you too much or not not enough, like something that someone said to you at a certain time. Like that can literally affect the cortisol in your body, which can affect how you later respond to certain foods or exercises. Like mm-hmm. everyone is different. So what I hear you saying, if I'm hearing correctly, is personalized health essentially. Like there is no definitive yes in terms of dietary um, requirements. Um, there, I, I would suggest, what absolutes are there might even be a, an even yep. um, more interesting question because we always, t- I think what we all agree on is getting sunlight, drinking lots of water, doing some form of exercise and eating and not eating processed foods is, is a win. Right, like well, so. What is, do we agree this, on? This, this, this is well. That was what I, as as a health expert, a number of years ago. What I realized is I had to uh, apply Pareto's law to try and sort out the the plethora of conflicting information. Of course, that's the eighty twenty rule, and eighty percent of what all the dietary components say is concordant, and the twenty percent usually applies to the variance. But that twenty percent could be significant enough that it gives you eighty percent of the results for that individual. And that's the variance. When people go on that link that you said, you'll, whether it purchase anything, it doesn't matter. You can go to the, go to the site and, and download my course called the Awesome Health Course. And I created an acronym, acronym as a filter to make a system, systematic assessment of what people could spend their time, their energy, and their resources in the most effective way given 30 years of my own, of my, of my own experimentation and training thousands of clients. And that started off with air and air is not very popular because it's free. Uh, deep breathing practices, you can control every aspect of your nervous system and, and, and the nervous system is what determines a threat or something that is going to excel, you know, uh, be food or fuel for your body in a positive way. Water. Maintaining hydration. You know, when I ran a holistic health clinic in Vancouver, British Columbia, we had an interstitial, electrical interstitial water scan. Virtually everybody that came into that place was chronically dehydrated. It's a, and that has massive complications in the short term and, 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 and dire consequences in the long term. Exercise. You know, we're in a new age and the unintended consequences of technological innovation is that we need to schedule exercise into our lives. Before, you know, a hundred years ago and beyond up in history, that was called living. You had to, everything was hard and difficult. The average person walked 20 miles a day, if you can believe that. That was the recommendation of the World Health Organization. You know, my grandfather uh, went to town on a, on, on a horse and, lo- and, and you know, logged, uh, you know, with an ax and saws and things like that. So that's not that long ago that the advent of technological innovation has allowed us to just be totally lazy sloths. And the human body doesn't work very well if it doesn't have some sort of stimulus in, in the form of stress physically. It just doesn't work. You can, if you put a person in a hospital bed, no matter how healthy they are, and you, you don't let them move, they waste away extremely quickly. Very, very quickly they waste away. And so those three, air, water, and exercise, that's where you need to put the bulk of your energy in to start out. Forget the diets, forget everything else. Fourth thing, sunlight. And I look at food as condensed light and I look at everything on the planet as light because I'm actually a, a little bit of a physicist by nature. That was the one area I had a great aptitude in school. And I had a friend that was a PhD in physics that ended up running the Gottlieb Space Center uh, for NASA, and we've had all sorts of discussions, and I got lots of integrations from him about understanding vibration and frequency, the difference between solidity, liquid, gas, and, and states. And I realized that most of what we see is actually just vibratory energy. Therefore, if I apply my diet, my life, my sleep, that goes into sleep, EMFs, uh, sun exposure. We spent most of our lives outdoors up until recently. Now we spend most of our time indoors. And so, you know, things like changing, putting on my swannies at night so that I can adjust to, cause light, we didn't have light before. We had starlight and moonlight at night. Not that's it, not, not, not halogen lights and not these things. So that's another issue. And then I went to optimizers. And so I went, well, if we're looking at the body, what is the one single unit that is ubiquitous through the entire body? And that is cells. 
It's the one unit, like there's liver cells and brain cells, but the cell itself functions relatively the same way behind the mechanics of how it works. So I went, well, what are the things that we know that make those cells work properly? Well, it comes down to enzymes, probiotics, the only two organism things, entities that do work in the body. There was essential amino acids, right? Because you need enzymes to get your, your, your proteins, proteins to get your minerals, so essential minerals, essential vitamins, okay? We need essential fatty acids, that was inside the body. And then there were this unique category of herbs. And herbs is everything that's ergogenic plants that elicit some sort of metabolic or cellular or physiological response, which whether that's moving chi from one area to another, whether it's activating or deactivating regulatory uh, components, turning off and on uh, epigenetical responses. But those are the ways that we can start to tweak. Then there was mental beliefs and attitudes. Okay, because you can have a terrible program with a great attitude and live very well. You can have an amazing program with a terrible attitude or, or with a, you know, and, 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 and doesn't work out. So the bottom line is you have to be able to regulate your beliefs and your attitudes and continually upgrade them if you want to have a different period of life. And then finally, education, which is to learn from within. Uh, which is a deuce and you learn from within by testing and the best way to optimize your testing is through coaching So I call it etc. And the whole acronym air water exercise sunlight optimizers mental beliefs education testing and coaching Is the acronym awesome and I put together a course that allows people to go through that sequentially over a 12-week period and our friend Ty Lopez inspired me uh, when I took a 67-day course uh, I said, well, I'm going to create an 84-day course because it always takes about 12 weeks to really radically alter your health or your physiology uh, or, or maintain a different body fat level. I knew this from my bodybuilding day. So I created an 84-day course that outlines those seven principles. And I took all the people I know, just like he did, and put all the links and all that stuff so people can watch it at five to 15 minutes while they're standing in line to vote or standing in line at a restaurant or a grocery store or, or uh, uh, you know, with the kids or whatever. And so... That was the philosophy I developed to deal with that problem that you had. So that was a really long answer, but I don't want to give little bullet points to people because I'm doing them a disservice and leading them in a direction where they're going to run into a brick wall. Mm. Thank you for being so thorough with that. Yeah. Um, Wade, let me ask you, you, meant, you referenced the Swannies there before in sleep. So uh, what's your understanding of why we should be blocking all of this artificial light uh, at night, whether it's through a pair of you know, blue light blocking glasses like the Swannies or other, other ways. How do you do it? What's your, you know, your mindset around optimizing sleep? Yeah, so you know, my business partner, Matt Gallant, is probably the, one of the greatest sleep experts I'm actually aware of. Uh, he's uh, extraordinary in his understanding and in his um, approach to sleep. He had, he, was, he had a lot of trouble with sleep. And I was a person that didn't have a lot of trouble with sleep. And it turns out there's a genetic component to that. And so he introduced me the concept of blue light blockers and containing these lights. And I had studied light and sunlight and going back to Carl uh, Rollier, uh, Dr. Rollier, who used different sp spectrums of light to heal people way back at the turn of the century. And ultimately, there was a lot of interesting things that happened around that. And so he introduced me to the concept. And so one night, he gave me these blue, set, blue light blockers, and I literally felt myself get sleepy after about 30 minutes of wearing them. And I was like, that just blew my mind. So I was like, what is all this about? Well, then it turns out as we started to do some investigation and he was very helpful. That was our researcher, Katrine Walensky, who does a lot of our genetics and epigenetic testing is like that we run on these circadian rhythms inside, which are based, basically it's a solar reset system. So there's advantages to getting up early and seeing the sunrise and there's advantages to, you know, being in a, a darker world. But however, with the technological innovations of light technology, um, we discovered that staying with all this light upwards can, can really throw off our circadian rhythms that has been built into biological organisms since as long as this has been a planet. 
and a hormone cascades, sleep relaxation cascades, how we go from fight or flight to rest and relax are all cooked into this. Uh, and in a world of increased light and uh, electromagnetic frequencies, I love the advantages that we get. I'm certainly not uh, an anti-technologist or some people are I'm like, well, based on the technology we've developed, I like that we can turn on the lights at night and see at night. And I love the fact that we have TVs and computers, but it turns out the blue light in them is very disruptive to these circadian rhythms of cycles. And so most of the biohackers I know are using um, various forms of these type of, of glasses such as you've developed, which by the way, I, I got to say, I look pretty darn good in these things. And, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm smarter when I wear yours because I look kind of like what the, the prototypical nerdy guy. So I moved from my jock self to my nerdy self. That's a little sidebar. I'm kind of revealing too much of my psychological process. But anyways, uh, <laughs> bottom line is, is I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And I started to experiment with them. And I noticed when I did my sleep tracking that if I wear them at night, I get a deeper sleep and I get a more restful sleep than if I don't. So it just became really that simple. It's like, okay, all my friends in the biohacking community are using it. Let me try it. Let me experiment with it. Put them on. What happens? And boom, there is the result. It's measurable. It's definitive. Okay, I'm done. And it's really that simple. And I think in today's world, there's so many people that are looking for 470,000 experts to concur on whatever decision before they make a decision. And they waste all their time doing research when all they need to do is get a testing device in the N of one, a couple little testing parameters, try the darn things and see if they work. And that's it. And I do this with everything. I, someone tells me this, this vitamin is good for me. Okay. Well, I'll be agnostic. Sure. Well, I'm not going to say it's not. I'm not going to say it is. I'm going to do an experiment. And if it works for me, I say, yeah, that worked for me. And if it doesn't work for me, I said, well, it didn't work for me. I tried that before. Was there something I didn't know? And sometimes there's devils in the details and there's nuances and it's really simple to do. And that's really it. And it's so freeing. And so I think so many people have forgotten their ability just to run tests because that's how animals and organisms on this planet has just run A-B tests, which is the whole process of evolution, which is cooked into our nervous system. So yeah, that's how I got into it. So yeah, test everything. I test everything. That. Be a mad scientist. Uh, and then final, finally, I just want to ask you about um, alcohol. What's your uh, alcohol consumption like? What do you understand about it as to what it does to the body? Um, what's your understanding that happens to the body if you stop feeding it alcohol? You know, what levels? Just any, like any anecdotes or anything that you yeah. do know about that, even if you don't feel like you're an absolute expert in it. Yeah, my, my alcohol consumption is zero. I do not drink alcohol. And I haven't drank alcohol for a long time. And I was really good at drinking alcohol in my younger days. And um, upon reflection in my 30s, I looked back at all of the, this, go again, because if you're not reflecting on what you're doing, I think that's a big mistake. But I looked back on all my decisions and I went, hmm, when I looked at all the decisions I made while consuming alcohol, I couldn't definitively find any sustainable positive outcomes from them. Nothing. Like when I really looked at it, because I also compared it again to the decisions I made without alcohol. And that meant social occasions, that meant going out, that meant going to parties and dancing and doing all the things that are oftentimes associated with alcohol sporting events. And I realized that the quality of those experiences were not enhanced by alcohol. What I could say is that there was corollary uh, downsides to the consumption of alcohol that had much longer effects after those events that I really felt that the cost benefit ratio was a very easy decision to make. And I just stopped drinking. Mm. Well done. Smart just man. Really, yeah, well, yeah. It's, it, it just was. And, and I don't go around and I go to lots of social occasions. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a vigilante vegan. I'm not against anybody doing whatever I believe. I'm actually kind of a fiscally conservative libertarian. I think that we want, I'd, I'd like maximum choice opportunity matrix. 
I would like the government to, to do the minimal amount of things to keep us safe from foreign invaders and from criminals. And that's about it. And everything else, I believe that we could figure out on our own if we all just get along. And, and, and that's how I kind of view my own life. And that way I don't project my beliefs onto anybody else. I will certainly advocate for my beliefs and, and argue them or put forth my ideas. And, and, and I love when other people challenge them because number one, I'll either refine my current position or I will abandon a uh, faulty logic, which there's plenty of it to go around both within myself and other people that, that I can upgrade what I've, what I know at this moment into a, a, a better, more holistic version. And I've been continually doing that for the last years. And it much, it's much easier uh, when you're not drinking because unfortunately alcohol dramatically impairs decision-making process as well as, um, you know, uh, how aggressive you might see someone with a different opinion. Yeah. Well said. Well, Wade, thank you so much. Wade Lightheart, the co-founder and president at Buy Optimizers. Just a reminder, you can go to buyoptimizers.com forward slash Swanick. Um, that will lead to the shop. Swanick 10 is the code for 10% off. Make sure you grab uh wade's uh program there remind us what the program's called the free the free booklet you got there yes yeah, it's, it's 12 weeks of w energy and it's the awesome health philosophy we give it away to everybody that goes to our website you can utilize it take what you want i would recommend checking out the bucket theory of nutrition that video in particular as well as uh enzymes uh, also water technology i think that's a big one to address so all that sort of stuff you can get into and, and have fun with Wade, thanks so much for your time, Matt. It's been fun hanging out with you again and uh, getting to know a little bit more, more about you. And hopefully I'll see you sooner rather than later back in Venice Beach, California. Please, next time you're over, uh, hit me up and uh, we'll hang out here at the bio home. I'm, I'm looking at getting myself a pool table here in the office so I can entertain myself and my guests. It'd be fun to have you over. Thanks, Wade. Thanks for listening to the Alcohol-Free Lifestyle Podcast. I want to load you up with some free stuff right now. So if you want to go to jameswanick.com slash guide, I will send you my Quit Alcohol Guide, which has helped six-figure entrepreneurs and top professionals reduce or quit drinking. You can also text the word Quit Guide to the number 44222 if you're in the US, of course. It doesn't really work anywhere outside of the US. But if you're in the US on your mobile phone and you'd like that guide, text the word Quit Guide to the number 44222 or you can go to jameswanick.com slash guide. If you'd like to schedule a free 15-minute call with one of my top coaches, just an exploratory call to see if or how we can help you, then you can go to jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word PROJECT90 to the number 44222 if you're listening in the US on a mobile phone. That's jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word PROJECT90, that's one word, PROJECT90, to the number 44222. Feel free to send me a direct message over on my Instagram account, which is at James Swanick. You can also watch video episodes of this podcast and a series of other educational videos on my YouTube channel, which is James Swanick One, or you can direct message me on Facebook at James Swanick Official. And finally, a request. Would you please now write a short review of the podcast inside of the Apple Podcast app on your phone or on iTunes on your desktop? Computer. Would you please give the show five stars and write a quick one or two sentence review? This will help the show get in front of even more listeners, potentially transforming someone's life. You can rate and review the show inside of your Apple podcast app on your phone or over on iTunes on your desktop. Thank you so much and I'll catch you next time.